assembly member uh, in the state of California from, from Oakland, two-time mayor of the city of Oakland, uh, former uh, labor judge, and was our seven-year chancellor for the Peralta Community College District, a great supporter of the Freedom Center, a great comrade to love and justice. Give it up for Ellen. <laughs> somebody, if we all ought to be mad at Donald Trump, mm -hmm. but we mm -hmm. when people can turn you against other human beings and not see positive possibilities, not see how we work together with the spirit of collaboration, how we try to find our common goals. Because, you know, wherever you go in the world, and I had a chance to travel pretty extensively, humanity is pretty much the same. Yeah. It's when we let other things and other people and ideologies turn us away from each other that we get confused. We get into a state of war. We decide that we, are, we have more in conflict than we have in common. And that's when the bad things happen. You know? So now we're concerned about what's going on in the Middle East with ISIS. We're concerned about what's going on with global economics and what's going to happen when China uh, takes jobs or Mexico takes jobs in the United States. Well, you know, those things happen as civilization uh, grows, as transportation becomes faster, as technology increases. There's going to be a lot of things that are going to change, and we either got to adapt to the changes, or we're going to be consumed by them. And a lot of people just choose to wait, be consumed, be angry, and not figure out how to make the adjustments. For example, when I was growing up, and obviously it's a long time from you guys to that point, uh, 
we have, it opened with a manufacturing-based community. I mean, people worked at <coughs> automobile plants. They worked at canning factories. You didn't have to have much more than an eighth grade education in order to have a livable job uh, and, and a, a livable wage. Um, now, we have a knowledge-based economy. You don't understand coding. You don't understand uh, what college can mean in terms of ability to do critical thinking. You don't understand how you fit into the world. You're going to get lost in it. And that's why education is important. It's not just because you want to learn how to just think, but learn how to do, learn how to figure things out, learn how to adapt to change. That's one of the things really happening in our community is becoming a much greater gap between the educated and those who are capable of making change and those who are uneducated and those who can't adjust to change, can't adjust to technology, can't adjust to changing economics and circumstances. So the first thing we have to do in terms of being able to be collaborative is be prepared. If you're not prepared, the old saying goes, you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, where are you trying to go? What do you want to do with your life? It's a one-way one trip. And even though you're very young, I'm telling you, life goes by very fast. Mm -hmm. You know, it goes fast. It's, it's like a roller coaster. You know, have you ever been a roller coaster? Yeah. 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 When the roller coaster starts up, it starts real slow, mm -hmm. then it goes over the top, <laughs> then all of a sudden it's feeling you hold off for dear life. <laughs> <laughs> At some point, that's going to happen to you. You say, wow. But that, that year just went by so fast. Mm -hmm. you know, or now, now all of a sudden you say, wait a minute, what happened to such and such? Oh, he left, he went to, he moved over here. Your friends are going to be dispersed mm -hmm. throughout the universe. You're not, you're not longer to be in a comfort zone. You may not be living with your parents. You may not be seeing the same people, living in the same town. And if you can't make the, uh, the ability to adapt to different languages or different cultures or different people or different environments, you got to really be in a, a world of hurt. So I think one of the things you have to do is know who you are. Know what's important to you. And understand that youth is not an excuse, it's an opportunity. You know, look at Martin Luther King. You know, I don't, a lot of people are talking about Martin Luther King. Uh, many of you probably were at the last lecture we had with Fred Gray, who was Martin Luther King's lawyer. Fred Gray grew up in Alabama. At 24 years old, he got out of law school. He's a 24-year-old lawyer in Alabama. And all of a sudden, he got confronted with a young woman, 15 years old, who was arrested because she wouldn't move in the right place. They wanted her to sit on the bus. When they had segregated <coughs> buses, they said, well, black folks, you got to sit in the back. And even if you're sitting at the back, if somebody white gets on the bus, you got to give up your seat to them. Regardless of who they are, age, gender, it makes no difference. Anybody white had privilege. But as a result of that, she didn't give up her seat fast enough, and she went to jail. And Fred Gray defended her. Well, after, after she got arrested, then an older woman also got arrested for refusing to give up her seat, and that was Rosa Parks. And what was interesting about that whole issue was that he was a young lawyer, had not been prepared to do civil rights law or any of that, but he took up the challenge. And he got Martin Luther King, who was a young minister, 26 years old, in town, to become the leader of the Montgomery Bus Boycott. So you don't have to be old to be a leader. You don't have to have experience to be a leader. What you have to do is be prepared for an opportunity when time, when time comes. And one of my favorite quotes is, no force on earth that can stop an idea of this time has come. When that time comes, it's a question of you're going to be ready. That's why you're here today. That's why you're in school. That's why you're preparing for your future. Because you don't know what you're going to be dealing with. But if you're prepared to deal with anything, that's all you got to be concerned about. Understanding communication, understanding critical thinking, understanding conflict resolution, understanding collaboration. All these things are relatively simple terms, but they're hard to apply. But if you've never done them, never thought about them, never prepared for them, you're going to get overwhelmed and you're going to get overtaken by circumstance. That's what I really want to tell you today. Is this is really important and valuable time you're spending together, learning from each other listening to each other, understanding how you can work together and make a change, and not be overwhelmed by the fact that Donald Trump is the president. It's just a moment in time. Four years are going to go by. President, what do you do in four years? Can you take him out? If not, you have eight years of Donald Trump. And that means you're going, to be, you're going to be in a hole so deep, you might as well just pull in the dirt over you. <laughs> so now is the time to start thinking and planning. What is the world you want to live in? What are you going to do over the next four years? 
to be better prepared for politics or for a job or for education. That's what we're all about, preparation and opportunity. Be able to meet it head on, not be confused or intimidated by it, but say, hey, just one more thing I got to deal with. And then you face that throughout your life. So anyway, those are kind of beginning thoughts. But I don't know if I uh, touch on anything more than one to touch on. But I'm just glad you got here. Go ahead, Liana. Um, well, many of us struggle with determining concrete means to accomplish our goals in life, how to get to where we want to go. What advice can you give us on making those steps? You know what? Uh, there's something called living off the land. And what that means is you look at what you got and you build it off of it. You know, the whole idea that your life gives you lemon, you lemonade. That's pretty much true. It's, it's an analogy. But you look at your circumstances. And, like, for example, one of the things when I was the mayor, I'd come across a lot of people who had problems. You know, people who were involved in drugs, people involved in crime, people who were homeless. And I didn't have a lot of answers for them. But when I became chancellor of the community colleges, the one thing I was able to do is say, you want an education? I can get you an education. You need a little financial aid? I can get you a little financial aid. You need some books? I can get you books. You have to take that get your bus voucher. But the question is, can you take that and make something out of it, or are you going to make excuses? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's too far. Bus too slow. Books too many. You know, you've got to be willing to meet those challenges and take the resources that are available to you and make them into something. It's like you can take thread and you have to make it into whole cloth. If you just look at it as a piece of thread, it's irrelevant. If you're a lot of threaded together, all of a sudden you may have a, a dress, a shirt, a coat, whatever it might be. So you always got to think about how do you put the pieces together? What are the pieces that I have available to me? How do I build upon that? One brick, you're not going to build a house. But if you got brick and mortar, you can build a house. So you take the tools that are available to you. Some people are, are great athletes. Some people are great thinkers. Some people are people who are patient, and they can use that patience. So you look at what's good inside of you. You look at what's unique inside of you, and use that to make your own independence and make you who you are. Be the best person you can be. I got a friend of mine who works at Laney, uh, Laney College, and he's got two master's degrees, but he's retired. So he's working as a janitor. He's not ashamed of it. He makes extra money for his family. And the thing about it is, he's going to be the best janitor he can be. Even though some people say, well, I got two master's degrees. Why am I working as a janitor? Well, because it's a job. It's a productive job. It's an honorable job. He likes to work with his hands. He's a hardworking guy. So all you got to do is understand that you got to be prepared to do what you got to do, honestly, productively, to make a contribution. You know, I had a job since I was nine years old. My father owned a, a funeral home, and I'm not saying that's a great thing, but, that's what <laughs> but, but he was a pretty successful guy. But he wouldn't give me anything. He wouldn't give me a quarter, a dime. I said, you know, Dad, can I have a dime? Go pick up some bottles. Can't you find some way to get a dive other than asking me for it? And uh, at nine years old, I got a paper route. And I started making my own money. And it was important to me because then I'd have to keep asking him and listening to those lectures. So it's always about what are your alternatives? You know, if, if you want to listen to the lecture, go keep begging for a dive. If you've got to go make a dive, and you'd rather do that than listen to a lecture, that's a choice. So you start making your choices in life. You want to have as many choices as possible. You want fewer people to control your life and your potential. You want to control your own destiny. So all I'm telling you is, look at what's around you. Look at the resources that are available to you. Talk to people. Network. Get to know people. Be around positive people. People in this room are positive. These are probably the better people to talk to than a lot of people you run into on the street. Because they're about a purpose. They're willing to sacrifice during the holiday to learn something, to improve themselves. Those are the kind of qualities you want in your friends, in your colleagues, in your associates. So all thing you can do is try to make sure you're positive, stay around positive people, be collaborative, use the resources available to get where you're trying to go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
was wondering, since we're all very young, a lot of times if we try to do something, we might not, we might face resistance since people uh, don't take us as seriously. How do you say you think we should combat that? Well, first of all, you know, um, age is nothing but a number. You know, there's something that you can't do uh, because you age. Most of the things you should probably want to do. It's drinking, smoking, you know. Uh, now, one thing you can do to young do is vote. But it doesn't mean you can't get involved in politics. It doesn't mean you can't knock on doors to educate voters. It doesn't mean that you can't be out learning about the issues yourself. So there are things you can always do. Age should not be a barrier to your growth and to your ability to contribute. It's just a factor. And sometimes, when you're young, what you got is more energy. When I first ran for the legislature, they said, oh, you're not going to get elected. Because all you have is a lot of your young friends. But my young friends went out, went door to door, talked to older people, and the older people were, they said, wow, these young people are out, this must be really for real. These young people are out campaigning, working in politics. And that's all I'm telling you. You have to take your youth. If that's your advantage, you use your youth to your advantage. You excite people with your energy. You challenge people to do things better and make, it, make things better. If somebody's in elected office, go to them. Say, how can we get this problem in our community? What are you doing about it? you got to challenge power, speak truth to power. There's nothing about being young to stop you from doing that. So take your youth and use it to your advantage. Use that energy. Use that inquisitiveness, that willingness to challenge power. And use that to make yourself stronger and your community better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mr. Elio, um, my name's Abel. Um, like, based off your previous answer, if we are already leaders in our community, um, assisting other like adult leaders, like during this time when we're about to get a new person elected in office, and like many like people are here, I, I bet we're all inspired to create change. But what about those who don't? Those other students, our peers, who aren't inspired and are just giving up right now. What could we do as leaders in our community? to inspire those around us, our peers, other youth in our community to rise up or like to create change themselves? Well, two things. One, a couple of things are. One, um, you got to lead by example. Um, you know, some people try to lead by preaching. They tell people what they ought to do rather than show them how to do it. Uh, the, old, the old saying, you know, uh, teach, uh, give a person a fish, they eat for a day, teach them how to fish, they eat, eat for a generation or a lifetime. Well, that's true about uh, friendships and relationships. If you're in school, you know, be a leader. Don't, don't always be a follower. Um, when things are difficult, you know, if the school is, is, is dirty, if you decide it ought to be cleaned up, get some of the friends who are willing to go out and clean up and clean up. Um, you know, one of the things, for example, when I was mayor, was we had a lot of problems with illegal dump sites and graffiti. So what we decided to do was, we decided we were going to, A, clean up every illegal dump site within 24 hours and get, get, get rid of any graffiti we saw within 24 hours. So we did that. And eventually the people doing the graffiti and the legal dumping got tired. Some got arrested, some of them got uh, fined, but they figured out that it was easier to go take it to the dump or not do the graffiti than to mess up their neighborhoods. So we started doing uh, art on the walls rather than just senseless uh, paint on concrete and things like that. So again, some of it's just talking to people, and some of the people you know who are doing wrong, uh, you have the ability to influence them. Sometimes you do it again by example, some of you do it by you know, talking to them, and sometimes by showing them another way. You don't have to do that. You want to do art, why don't you do real art? Instead of just taking a, 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 a spray paint can and messing up somebody's property, why don't you actually learn how to draw? Why don't you go to school and learn how to be an artist? Sometimes it's talking to people, and everybody's not going to listen. You can't save everybody. Some of you refuse to be saved, you know. Uh, but those who are willing to listen, sometimes they just need to be talked to, need to be encouraged, need to know there's a different way, there's an alternative. And uh, can't be afraid to approach people. You know, you don't try to dictate to people. There are people who are crazy. And you, know, you talk to them, and sometimes you, know, you say, I think I'll let you go to do what you're going to do. <laughs> <laughs> you're nuts. Um, but there are other people that you know, somebody to say, wow, nobody ever talk, told me that. Nobody ever told me there was a different way. Nobody told me there was another place I could go, other people I could be with. I'm just my knucklehead friend. There's only people I know. But you know how to be with them. But nobody ever talked to me who had sense. Well, sometimes I talk to them, approach them. You know, you'd be surprised how many people uh, don't have parents at home, or brothers and sisters, or even friends, who encourage them to be better, to maximize their potential. Be one of those people. You know, there's, there's, there's two kinds of people. There are basement people and balcony people. 
Baptist people try to lift people up. Eastern people try to pull them down. You got to figure out which way you are. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, Mr. Harris. How do, how do you think we ended up with Donald Trump as our president? Um, two of you didn't vote, uh, didn't care. Figure out it doesn't make any difference. A lot of people say, well, politics is somebody else's business. Or it doesn't make any difference who is involved. And when you think that way, uh, and I'm not saying that, that, that Hillary Clinton was the best candidate, she was better than Donald Trump. You know? so, then, so then you say, look, rather than complaining about who people are running for office, get better people to run. You know? Be one of those better people. You know, I see, you know, Open City Council is relatively weak as far as I'm concerned, but I don't see anybody better running. You know, I don't see young people stepping up, getting other young people, organizing, um, and running to be on the city council. Um, there's no reason that the 21-year-old can't be on the city council. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the 21-year-old's got to have the thoughts, the ideas, the ability to communicate those ideas, not only to their other 21-year-olds, but to older people. And say, look, hey, we can do better. Here's what I hear my ideas. What are your ideas? Let's put our ideas together and put together an agenda. Let's go down to city hall and kick some butt. Nothing wrong with that. I mean, physically kick your butt, by the way. <laughs> well, in Tony's school, kick some butt, I'll kick yours. Right? Okay. <laughs> but, but I have to say that taking young people and using that energy, and, but having an agenda. You've got to have an agenda. What do you want to do? You're in charge. What are you going to do first? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I didn't think about that. Well, you know, think about it. If you were the mayor, if you were on the city council, if you were the city administrator, what would you do differently? If you're the police chief, how would you do policing differently? You've got to start thinking about those things so when you're in a position to make change, you know what, what kind of change to make. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing. And, and I think the other thing is start going to city council meetings. Mm -hmm. Go to city council meetings and listen to those fools. And you say, whoa, <laughs> I can do better than that. I'm smarter than them. I mean, I remember the first time I got a job in Washington, D.C. And, and, and I remember... Uh, I was across the street from the State Department, and I was looking at all these magnificent buildings, and I said, wow, the smartest people in the world are inside those buildings making decisions, making changes. Then I went inside those buildings and said, these people are stupid. <laughs> <laughs> They're not smart. They're just hiding behind the walls of these buildings. You know, that's when you start finding out that you know, you're as smart as anybody. You're as capable as anybody. Don't get intimidated by somebody who's older, somebody who's got a title. They're just another human being. Maybe they got a better idea, and maybe they don't. But you can ask them, listen to them, make your own determination. But don't assume that somebody knows what they're doing because they got a title or because they're older. Challenge them, ask them questions. If they don't have good answers, try to find the answers and apply it yourself. Woo! Mr. Harris, yeah. <clears throat> you, as you said before about being prepared, how, how can we be prepared as, as young leaders for what's coming up on January 20th? Well, first thing is, you have to understand the limitation. You know, you're not in Washington. You know, you're not in New York. Donald Trump pretty much is a, he may not even come to California for the day. <laughs> um, but, but, what you do is, you read, and you learn. Because four years is going to go by relatively quickly, the overall scheme of things. So what you start doing is say, all right, um, let me see what Donald Trump is doing. Let me see what he's doing wrong. Let me figure out how I would do it better. If Donald Trump is not doing well in economics, how would I do economics different? How would I do education different? How would I do housing differently? How would I take care of the homeless problem? How would I deal with the drug problem? All these different problems. We're overwhelmed by problems. But we're not overwhelmed by a solution. So you've got to figure out which one you are, part of the problem or part of the solution. And once you figure that out, the rest of it will take care of itself. So right now, prepare. When there's an opportunity to serve, there's an opportunity to lead, there's an opportunity to demonstrate, do that. When an opportunity to make change, make the change. But it's always about being prepared when that opportunity comes. You don't know when it's going to come, but you got to be prepared when it does. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the election, the president's election, you know, is really important, but what's also really important, I think you mentioned it before, is, you know, local, mm -hmm. you know, our mayors, yeah. city council members, Congress. How do we educate people to vote locally and be more engaged in what's going around just in our community, not, you know, the whole like, president? Well, the well, first thing is, I, like I said, identify the problem that you see in the community. What are the problems? Uh, are the problem in school? You know, the school system is not working as well as it could. Uh, the problem with crime, you know, problem with 
people being, being killed senselessly without purpose. People killing each other on property they don't even own. You're on my corner. You don't own this corner. You know, so you start really understanding that if you kind of figure out what the problem is, then you can start figuring out how to go talk to people, how to be about collaboration and organizing. Organizing is really important. Mm -hmm. you, know, and you, and you don't have to organize the whole city. Organize your block. You know, try, you know, you'd be surprised when people live on a block don't even know their neighbors. Yeah, that's right. Amen. You know, I remember I lived, I lived in an apartment, and I didn't know anybody lived on a block. Left side of me, the right side of me, above me, or below me. I don't know anybody. And if I if I got locked out, I'd just been locked out. I could have knocked on anybody's door. Or if I did, they probably figured I was a crook. They didn't, they, they, you live next door? How come you live next door? Three years. How come you never knocked on the door? I never got locked out before. <laughs> so, so it really is uh, about trying to organize and trying to know your world. If it's your school, if it's your neighborhood, if it's where you work, uh, wherever it is, understand that. And then begin to I, network. Network is really more important than a lot of people realize. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't know anybody, and you don't have any sense of uh, organ organization or collaborative power, then you're going to have limited power. The more people in that network, the more people contribute to that network, the more you're going to be able to make the kind of change we're talking about. You start on your block, then you start your neighborhood, then you start in a broader community, then you start in your city council district. You know, and if you have that kind of organization and that kind of collaborative, A, you or somebody who you have respect for will be able to run for office and get elected. Look, District 5 is considered predominantly uh, Hispanic or Latino district on the city council. Only about 5,000 people out of 60 or 60 or 70,000 people in that district actually voted. So with 5,000 people, you know, mo most of you probably, if you thought about it, could mean 5,000 people. Question, you have enough organization to get 5,000 people to the polls and to get them behind one candidate. You know, it's doable. Start with one district. Don't try to take over the entire city. There you go, guys. Start with one, one block, one neighborhood, one council district, and say, mm -hmm. we're going to turn it around right here. We're going to get somebody who has the potential, not only to make change, but maybe ultimately be the mayor of the city and who will follow through on things that we believe are important. So as we get older, we'll also be in a position to be part of the uh, solution rather than part of the problem. It's like a building block. Start here, try to get to there. Thank you. One more, one more. Those who might try to get in our way, or even some of those who are even personal to us, like family or friends, because not everybody can agree with what we're going for, their worries get in the way. I have a perfect example for you. Uh, in, in February, the Freedom Center is having Bob Moses. That's right. You know the name about Bob Moses? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, Bob Moses was one of the only leaders of the student out of Bob Coordinating Committee. And you know, you know why that was for And they felt the older civil rights leaders at that time, in their 30s, <laughs> they were older, right? <laughs> Martin, they were too slow, right? So, and, they, and the SNCC used to have a motto I used to really love. The motto was, move on over or we'll move on over you. <laughs> and, and, and that's part of it. You know, people are always going to agree with you. Sometimes you talk to them and try to convince them. Sometimes you wait and are patient. But sometimes you say, look, I can't, can't wait anymore. You know, I mean, the, the, the people used to try to tell, so right, you know, why, why are you so impatient? You know, change is going to come. But when? And that's sometimes you say, why we can't wait? So part of it is you try to discuss with people, but when they aren't willing to listen, you say, look, you know, I understand we, we disagree, but you got to do what you got to do, and I got to do what I got to do. You know, you don't have to necessarily, Donald Trump may not do the things that I want him to do, but I can be prepared to make sure that he's not going to be in position much longer to do the things that I disagree with. Yeah. So you're going to find people disagree with you. Sometimes you can change their mind, and sometimes you can't. But when you can't change your mind, it doesn't mean that you give up on your dreams, your goals, your aspirations. You just keep working. You can try to find a different way to get what you're trying to get done. You know, it's like, we got city council elections coming up in two years. We're going to have a new mayor. We also got a new governor coming in two years. You know, Jerry Brown was the mayor of Boca. Uh, and, you know, he's, he succeeded me as mayor of Boca. 
And then you ran for attorney general, and you ran for, for, for governor. Now, the problem is Jerry Brown was older than dirt. And, <laughs> and, and as a result of that, you know, he really is not, he, I mean, he's doing a decent job as governor. I don't like Jerry Brown, but that's another problem. Um, but, 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 but I said, well, I can wait. Two years, he'll be out. So I'm trying to work with whoever's going to be the next governor, have a better relationship, and have more impact on that agenda, and, that, and those kind of changes that I yeah. think are important. But now is the time to do that. Mayor's coming up in two years, we go back for mayor. Governor's going to come up, we be back for governor. Mm -hmm. Then in four years, you can talk about who may be uh, the, uh, the, uh, the next president. You know, I'm going to tell you, Count, have you heard of Kamala Harris? Yeah. 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 Well, Kamala Harris grew, uh, grew up, born in Oakland, uh, grew up in Oakland, Berkeley, and Montreal, uh, went to uh, Howard University, went to uh, oh, she was Hastings Law School, and she became a deputy district attorney in Oakland, in Alameda County. And then she became a deputy district attorney in San Francisco. Then she became deputy city attorney in San Francisco. Then she became the district attorney in San Francisco. Then she became the Attorney General of the State of California. Now, Ooh. she is the uh, second African-American woman uh, to be elected to the U.S. Senate. Mm -hmm. And she's African-American Indian. Yeah. Her mother was Indian, mm -hmm. Indo-American, and her father was uh, Af African-American, actually from Jamaica. Mm -hmm. The point is, she started just like you guys did. And she had to build a career. She had to build a life. You know, she was raised by a single mother. Her mother died of cancer. She didn't have a mother or any other sibling. Now, she is the U.S. Senator. Her sister, Maya, is vice president of the Ford Foundation, and her brother-in-law is the general counsel for PepsiCo. You know, they start here like everybody else. You know, you start somewhere. Where you end up is up to you. Wherever you start is almost irrelevant. It's where you end up that you have to focus on. So if you want to change the city of Oakland, let's start with the city council district, see if we can find a better candidate for mayor, and begin to change our community. If you change our community, you can change the world. If you can't change where you are, you're not going to get anywhere and you're not going to make a change anywhere else. Personally, I feel like a lot better um, in what's going on, and I, 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 on behalf of the Freedom Center, we would love to tell you thank you, and thank you for sharing your knowledge with us.